Monsieur Bolden est quelqu'un qui a une, une vie absolument extraordinaire et euh, qui on peut résumer en trois grandes parties, trois grandes étapes. La première comme militaire, où il a servi pendant la guerre du Vietnam comme pilote Day 6 Intruder, à bord duquel il a fait plus de 100 missions, dans le sud Vietnam certes, mais dans le nord si dangereux. En 1980, il a commencé sa deuxième carrière puisqu'il a été recruté par la NASA et a eu l'occasion de piloter certainement l'un des plus beaux aéronefs de l'histoire de l'humanité, qui est ni plus ni moins que la navette spatiale américaine. De cette carrière, M. Bolden a passé 28 jours, 8 heures et 37 minutes dans l'espace, et à ce qui paraît, pendant lesquels il a beaucoup sympathisé avec les extraterrestres. En 2009, le président Barack Obama lui a confié le poste d'administrateur de la NSA. C'est ni plus ni moins que le premier afro-américain à accéder à, cette, à ce poste. En 2010, lorsque Discovery a atterri sur Mars, le premier broadcast qui a eu lieu, c'est la voix de M. Bolden sur cette planète. Oui, je pense que vous avez devant vous une véritable légende de la conquête spatiale. Mais vous avez surtout devant vous un homme né en Caroline du Sud, en 1946, qui a vécu son enfance dans un état ségrégationniste où de par votre couleur de peau, vous n'avez pas accès à tous vos droits fondamentaux. Ou un état où, par votre couleur de peau, vous n'aviez pas le droit de vous asseoir dans un bus à côté de certaines personnes. Et c'est par son travail, son intelligence hors du commun et un physique forgé par des heures et des heures d'entraînement qu'il est devenu aujourd'hui patron d'une des plus grandes et extraordinaires agences mondiales, la NASA. Je vous demanderai donc de bien vouloir accueillir sous un tonnerre d'applaudissements M. Bolden. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I, um, I understood nothing. <laughs> Except he said Bolden every once in a while. And I did hear Vietnam. And how many of you ever, how many of you other than history, reading a history book, know where Vietnam is? How many of you know anything about Vietnam? That's okay. That's good. And I, that's the reason you, you, I rest my case. Where's Mr. O'Brien? People who write my bio, I rest my case. I keep saying, you know, we always tell people about, uh, that was a long time ago, Vietnam, and, and students your age don't relate. Uh, another thing students your age don't relate to, how many of you, let me look before I ask this question. I would venture to say that other than the Chargé and Mr. O'Brien and me, maybe... No, even you weren't. <laughs> There are probably three of us in here who saw Neil Armstrong land on the moon. Am I correct? Yeah, four. Four? <laughs> really? Five? Man, we're old. You didn't see it. Did you really? On the end? Did you really? No. Okay. So let me, let, let me, let me, uh, I, I, this is very informal, first of all. Uh, You can ask questions anytime you want to. I, in fact, I encourage you to ask questions. Uh, and the second thing is there are no dumb questions. You, you cannot ask a question that probably has not been asked before, usually by an elementary school student, uh, because elementary school students, students who are under the age of 12, are uninhibited in their questioning. As they grow older, you all will remember this. Uh, and they get into junior high, but especially in high school, then uh, there is an unwritten rule that says, thou shalt not ask a question when someone comes to my school. So I would hope that you all will not be like high schoolers and not ask questions, because it's really important that we have an opportunity to talk with each other and talk back and forth. But let me take a guess at what was the closest to your uh, Apollo 11 moment. Uh, and, and tell me if I'm wrong. How many of you saw Curiosity Land on, the, on Mars? Yeah, I mean, not, you know, not, not like, you, I know you weren't there, because <laughs> I, I was just like you. I was watching it on a screen. I just happened to be at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena in the control center watching it land. But how many of you saw it somewhere, sitting somewhere in the world? Okay. Uh, were you excited? Was it something, like, unbelievable uh, to you? Those of you who did have an opportunity to see it, uh, that's probably the closest thing to your Apollo 11 moment. 
And uh, I try to explain that to people. And so what I'm looking for now is for people who will help me make Apollo 11 moments for uh, young people in the world today, all over the world, because they need something like that that can inspire them and get them really, really, really excited and say, I want to be a part of that, and I want to make those kinds of things happen. And so I hope that's what you're doing here at, uh, do I pronounce it correctly when I say Ecole 42? 42? Is that close? It's okay. It's perfect. What? No, that's not perfect. I can tell. How do, how do you pronounce it? What? <laughs> He's having an Apollo moment. How do you pronounce the name of the school? I don't speak English. Oh, that's okay. You're close enough. Really? Oh, I'm not even going to try. Okay, but anyway, so let's, let me try to go through some slides. And like I said, I have far more slides than, than I, we will ever get through probably. So I'd hope that you would ask questions and maybe I'll get through one or two of them. But I, I put this up, and this is not meant to, to uh, insult your intelligence or anything, but I think... Hopefully, most of you now are beginning to understand what it is that's going to make you successful in life and whatever it is that you decide to do. You've got to study, first of all. I mean, and that's why you're here. Uh, some of you probably did not like school where you were because it just, the way it was taught didn't appeal to you. So you chose this environment because it enabled you to study a little bit more comfortably. Uh, but that's critical. That's what you have to do. And, and the reason you study is because, hopefully, you want to become the best in the world at what you do. Uh, if you want to be a programmer, if you want to be a computer scientist, if you want to be an astronaut, if you want to be a football player, a musician, uh, you have to study in order to equip yourself with the skills and the talent to be able to do that. The next thing is you have to work really hard at it. Uh, even here in the school, if you came to school and you tried to do the projects that they give you and you don't spend some time going through the at least the basic curriculum that's established, my guess is, you know, unless you're a prodigy um, or you're a genius, you probably can't just start right off and get really good at what you're doing. And you're probably not going to be really able to do the project and get it done such that you are the best in your particular class or your particular group. And when it's time for your peers to grade you or to assess how good you are, if you don't work at it, you're not going to do very well. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is don't ever be afraid of failure. Too many people are intimidated by failure, whether it's uh, I'll fall if I try to be an acrobat, or I'm too short and they'll never pick me, or I'm the wrong color, the, ra the wrong race, uh, the wrong religion, or something. You can't let the fear of failure keep you from trying to do what it is you want to do. Uh, in my line of work, when I was an astronaut, uh, you know, people, people ask all the time now, when you flew on the space shuttle, were you afraid? And I honestly say no. I was, um, I guess I was apprehensive, and that's a, that's a totally different word than being afraid. I was apprehensive because there were so many procedures that I had to learn in order to go on a flight. And I knew that if I didn't, if I didn't perform correctly, then I was probably going to put my crew and the vehicle at risk. And that was the last thing I wanted to do. So I would say I was apprehensive. But when you're laying on your back in a spacecraft, and uh, in, in the case of shuttle, you usually laid there for a couple of hours. You know, you got strapped in, and then everybody ran away. Uh, you know, they, they strap you in, you're laying on your back because the shuttle actually was mounted on the side of the, the big external tank. And you, and you waited and listened to the, to the ground crews all the way in Houston and there in Florida go through the pre-launch counts and make sure that everything was working right. Uh, until it was time to launch. And then finally, when it was time to launch, things started happening really quickly. Lots of noise and banging and <laughs> explosions and stuff. And, <laughs> and, you know, when you lift off, the vehicle shakes. And you can feel yourself just kind of sink back in your seat ever so gently. And then you, you can actually feel it rolling off the launch pad. And the next thing you know, you're going 17,500 miles an hour. So you were there sleeping a few seconds late earlier, and now you're going Mach 1 in the first minute, and after eight and a half minutes, you're going 17,500 miles an hour, 23,000, uh, 30, 32,000 or so uh, kilometers per hour. And, and that's, uh, that's pretty fast. <laughs> and, um, and, and all of a sudden, when everything ends and you're in space, and it takes eight and a half minutes to do that, 
uh, you find that you're kind of your body's pushing up against the straps because you're floating. Gravity has now overcome the speed at which you're going. We call it orbital velocity overcomes or equals gravity. The, the, the pull of gravity trying to bring you back to Earth is matched by the centrifugal force that's really trying to break the string of gravity and send you off to, to the moon or to somewhere else out in space. And so you, you learn what it's like to be weightless and you're weightless for some period of time. Today it's six months, uh, anywhere from four to six months. So we don't do camping trips anymore. I, I did camping trips. You know, it was mentioned that I spent 28 days in space. That's, that's a very, very short period of time, especially when you consider that those were six, seven, eight, and nine day missions. Today, crews fly six months at a time. And uh, so that's six months of being weightless and six months of learning how to live in a totally different environment. Uh, so next slide. Um, what's NASA? Who are we and, and what do we do? Uh, we're, uh, we are the space agency. Let me move over here. We are the space agency of the United States, and uh, we, co we are comprised of four uh, major pieces. Uh, we, we call them mission directorates. We have the Human Exploration uh, and Operations Mission Directorate, which is responsible today for operation of the International Space Station responsible for contracting with and, and working with our commercial partners now, with industry that takes cargo to the International Space Station and our international partners. They make the contracts with the Russians that gets our crews to the International Space Station, and they are also uh, the directorate that right now is responsible for the development, the design, the development, and the building of what we call the Space Launch System, a heavy lift launch vehicle that's going to take humans to an asteroid and then on to Mars in your lifetime because we're talking about getting to an asteroid in 2025 and then on to Mars in the 2030s. And then the Orion, which is uh, a multi-purpose crew vehicle that sits on top of the big rocket, and that's actually what the crews uh, will use to fly to deep space. All uh, living and working during the time that they're making that transit in a, in a vehicle, a component of Orion that's actually going to be made by the European Space Agency. So it'll be the service module. And the service module is a, a piece on the bottom of the, the crew module itself. When, when you get into space, the crew gets out of their seat, floats down into the service module, and you kind of eat, sleep, uh, work, do a lot of things down in the service module. That's essentially where you live. Next slide. The next one, um, human space flight is the, the big thing for which NASA is known. But, uh, but this is something that is ongoing. I tell people all the time, we've been through a lot in human space flight from the very, very early days of Mercury, then Gemini, two, two people, then Apollo, three people. And today, uh, well, shuttle went up to, we actually flew a shuttle flight that had an eight-person crew. Most crews were, were seven people, two pilots and, and five others. Today, we fly six people on the International Space Station continually. We rotate them out in groups of three. Uh, we call it an increment, and so a three-person increment goes to the International Space Station, is there for three months with, with the crew that was there when they arrived, and then that crew goes home. A new crew comes up, so the, old, the new guys become the old guys for the next three months. Uh, next, this coming March, so a little bit less than two months from now, for the first time in the history of human spaceflight, uh, we'll have a Japanese astronaut, Koichi Wakata, who will become the commander of the International Space Station. First time uh, that an Asian American has ever, in fact, an Asian, because he's not an Asian American, uh, has commanded the International Space Station. Chris um, Hetfield became the first Canadian last year to do the same. There have been two Europeans, uh, uh, Frank De Devine from, Devin from uh, Belgium, and, uh, and then we just rotate the command so that it's no longer just a Russian or a, an American that does it. Uh, the thing that Shuttle and the International Space Station has done that is most important to me personally uh, has nothing to do with the technical feat or the technical achievement. It's what it's done for humanity. Um, if you look at the, the faces up there, uh, in the days of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, you wouldn't see a picture like that because every single astronaut would have been a white Anglo-Saxon American test pilot. Uh, most of them about five feet ten, uh, all of them military. Uh, later in the, in the uh, Apollo program, we started to bring in science, scientist astronauts uh, who were not necessarily pilots, but they were still all white Anglo-Saxon. Um, today, 
thanks to the shuttle, uh, we have brought people into the space program who never would have been there otherwise. Uh, men, women, uh, African Americans, Indian Americans, uh, people from other countries, uh, people of all races, creeds, and colors. If you look at the two failures that we had in the space shuttle program, I always tell people, and I think I have an image of the two crews, you look at them and they're sort of the best story of the space program today. Uh, because they are a, a, the, a conglomerate of people from all over the world in the two crews that we happen to lose. Uh, next slide. Uh, that's me hanging around with a part of my crew. This is an old picture. Uh, this was inside the space shuttle Atlantis down in what we call the mid deck. On the space shuttle, it had two floors. So it was like a two-story house. Uh, the top story was the flight deck. And that's where four crew members sat for ascent, for going to space and coming back. Uh, the rest of the crew, whether it was uh, four more or five more, uh, sat down on the mid-deck. And then once we got into space, we took all the seats out of the mid-deck. So what used to be a cramped space or is a cramped space today in, an Apollo, in a Soyuz spacecraft, when you took the seats out of the mid-deck and stowed them away, there was a lot of room. So you can see there's one, two, three, four, four of us. Three other crew members are asleep. Uh, they're back, I got to get it right, they're back here in, uh, oh, they're about casket size sleep <laughs> compartments, that's the best way to describe it. Little wooden boxes with a sliding door. Uh, the crew member would float in, strap themselves into their sleep restraint, uh, could read for a little while or whatever, and then sleep. They had an eight-hour sleep period, and then they would rotate out and take the place of the, the, the operating crew. You get an opportunity to see, this is uh, Brian Duffy, my co-pilot. There's Brian Spoon. Uh, that's Brian's food, and it's great, delicious. We don't eat out of tubes anymore. We eat normal foods. The crew works with dietitians, picks their menu. The food is partially is prepared for them, then dehydrated, and it's packed away that way. So liquids, uh, liquids don't like to behave, so you have to drink through a straw, and you, you can mix whatever you want, whether it's milk, fruit juices, uh, coffee, and, and you drink that way. Uh, Dirk Vermout was a Belgian payload specialist. He's the Alan Shepard of Belgium. He was the first Belgian uh, astronaut. And uh, that's Dr. Kathy Sullivan, the first American woman to do a spacewalk. And Kathy's eating one of my favorite strawberries. Uh, absolutely delicious. And I'm up on my back with my back up against the ceiling because there is no up or down in space. Gravity is overcome, so the inner ear doesn't function and you lose your sense of up and down, sometimes causing confusion with some astronauts, and that's what we call space adaptation syndrome, or kind of space motion sickness. Next one. Uh, people always ask, what do you do when you're in space? Today we do lots of experiments. We do uh, uh, lots of technology development, if you will. Uh, the crew spends the vast majority of their time on the International Space Station either working experiments for people in, in colleges and universities, for industry, uh, for, for example, for pharmaceutical companies, you name it, anybody who has something that they want to fly on the International Space Station um, and, and, and gets it flown, uh, the astronauts are trained to do that for them. This was Franklin Chang Diaz and me on my last flight to space a long, long time ago. Uh, this was the first, our crew was the first joint U.S.-Russian uh, crew to fly in space and uh, had a crew member, Sergei Krikalov, who um, it, to date is the longest living person in space. Uh, he has lived more than two years of his life in space. Uh, he was there for 10 months on his first mission to space on, on Mir. He left Earth as a citizen of the Soviet Union from, his hometown was Leningrad. Uh, the Soviet Union disintegrated while he was there. He came back to Earth as a citizen of Russia, and his hometown had returned to its original name of, of St. Petersburg. Uh, today, uh, Sergei runs the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center outside of Moscow, where all of American and other astronauts are trained uh, to, to work on Soyuz. But we were doing some medical experimentation there. Franklin Chang Diaz is my hero, uh, born and raised in San, San Jose, Costa Rica. Uh, decided at the age of seven that he wanted to become an astronaut, told his dad he needed to go to the United States. His dad said, for what? He said, because I want to be an astronaut and I have to go to the United States. His dad said, sure, go back to school. <laughs> and so Franklin went back to school, graduated from Lincoln High School in San Jose, Cal San Jose uh, Costa Rica, went to his dad at the age of 17, said, okay, it's time. 
And his father looked at him and said, time for what? He said the same thing as it was 10 years ago. It's time for me to go to the United States because I want to become an astronaut. And his dad tried to talk him out of it, and he finally said, okay, I give. His father was an engineer who had friends in the United States, so he wrote Franklin a little note to a friend in Hartford, Connecticut, gave Franklin $50 in cash, a one-way ticket to Hartford, Connecticut, and the note to the friend said, this is my son Franklin. He thinks he wants to be an astronaut. Humor him for as long as you can and then send him home. And so Franklin came to the U.S. speaking no English, enrolled in the University of Connecticut, almost flunked out the first year uh, because of his lack of English, but taught himself to speak English, went on to graduate with honors from the University of Connecticut, and then to MIT where he earned a Ph.D. in plasma physics. And today he is considered to be one of the world's foremost plasma physicists. Uh, if any of you read about Vasma propulsion, V-A-S-I-M-I-R, I think, Vasma propulsion, it's sort of a type of ion propulsion that if it's ever perfected, it'll probably help us get humans to Mars in less, le much less time than it takes today, which is about eight months. So we could conceivably travel to Mars in, in four months or, or maybe even less. But that's Franklin, uh, a person who had a dream and decided, okay, I don't care what anybody says, I'm going to do this. Next slide. Um, we do a lot of different things. Science is the second biggest part of NASA's portfolio. And among the things that we're doing in science is um, visiting asteroids even today. Uh, we have satellites that are orbiting every planet in our solar system. There's a new satellite on its way to Jupiter called Juno that has a set of solar rays. So it, the, when it reaches Jupiter, it will be the first time in, in the history of humankind, at least that we know of, that a vehicle has gone all the way to an outer planet without nuclear power. It will go all the way there on solar cells uh, because they've used current state-of-the-art technology to power a satellite that, to operate in, in uh, deep space, out in the outer planets. Uh, Dawn was a satellite that we had that used little bitty thrusters called ion, uh, called Hall thrusters, that has been out in space for years now. And it, uh, Dawn visited this asteroid called Vesta, orbited Vesta for a year, studied it and imaged it. Uh, we learn more about Vesta than we ever thought of. Uh, it's big, for one thing, a huge asteroid. We found out it actually looks like it has some tectonic activity on it. We used to think asteroids were just rocks. Uh, we now know that asteroids are varied in their composition. Some of them are like, like small planets. In fact, Vesta has been sort of reclassified as a, um, as a dwarf planet. And so Dawn finished at Vesta. It's now off on its way to a, another uh, asteroid, a big, bigger asteroid, which is a dwarf planet called Ceres. Next slide. Uh, commercial space is where we are now. We, we already have perfected, or perfected, we've already facilitated the success of commercial ventures, of industry to carry cargo to the International Space Station. We now have two American companies, Orbital Sciences and SpaceX, that carry cargo for us. Out of Europe, you have ATV, the Autonomous Transfer Vehicle, uh, built by co cooperatively among the Italians and the French uh, that carries cargo to the International Space Station. The Japanese have an HTV. Uh, the Russians have progress. So there are a number of different vehicles that we use now to get cargo to the International Space Station. What we're working on right now is helping companies develop a capability to take crew. Um, we expect to get some, pro we have proposals in now from at least three companies, SpaceX, Boeing, and Sierra Nevada. Sierra Nevada has the only uh, entry that is not a capsule that I know of. It's a winged vehicle, looks like a miniature shuttle. Uh, what they all have in common is the capability to carry seven crew members. So we're looking at either a winged vehicle or, or capsules to carry crew members, and we're hopeful that within the next four years or so, uh, we'll fly the fir for the first time a private company carrying people to the International Space Station and other low Earth orbit destinations. You have a question or you just, you just move in your arm? Just, just move in your elbow. Okay, you all are shot. Yes. Doesn't who? Virgin Galactic. Oh, Virgin Galactic, as a matter of fact. Virgin Galactic flies what we call suborbital spaceflight. We don't talk a lot about suborbital spaceflight, but how many of you read about Alan Shepard? Okay. <laughs> One, two. Alan Shepard was America's first astronaut, 
And Alan Shepard did a suborbital flight. He lifted off from Cape Canaveral, went up just to the edge of outer space, and came back down. Virgin Galactic and a number of other private companies are going to engage in suborbital space flight. What's unique about it is that it now will give us an opportunity to take people into space. Uh, it's built for tourists, for the most part, because it gives, it gives someone with, with limited training an opportunity to view this planet from the perspective, uh, a perspective that I think will change their lives, to be quite honest. You look at the planet from the vantage point of space, and it changes your whole perspective on, on this planet on which we live. It is absolutely breathtaking. And you see it in a, from a, man, in a manner from, from the edge of space or from out in space that you can never imagine. And uh, so that's what Virgin Galactic's gonna do. If, if, they're, if they're fortunate, they will fly this coming summer uh, probably fly five people on, in their passenger crew. They have two pilots, and they've, uh, they're going through their final tests now. They've flown two, flight, two flights here recently, uh, testing their new engines, and everything looks good so far. So I think they're going to fly this summer. They will become the first company to do suborbital transportation of crews. Okay? Um, next one. This is, uh, NASA also does, this is Virgin, as a matter of fact. That's what Spaceship Two looks like. As you can see, it's got windows for the passengers. Uh, so the five people sit in the back, it gives them an opportunity when it, when it, it, it launches from a, I'm not sure how many of you know, but it, it sits underneath what's called the White Knight. It's a, another funky looking uh, airplane that kind of lifts off with it, takes it up into the air, drops it, and then it ignites its, its own rocket engine and, and then zooms up. And, uh, and it runs out of airspeed and ideas right about the time it gets into space. And then they just kind of roll and come back over and come back down to Earth and land on a runway. And they've been very successful so far. Next. And it's skipping? It, uh, well, it's, ba it's bad. It is much, much better than an X-15. Uh, well, that's true. Now, it's close to like the X-15 used to be, except the X-15 only had one person. And it was an experimental, uh, you know, Air Force airplane. So this does essentially what the X-15 did. But now, carrying people, so it's, it's a lot of what we fly today, the shuttle, um, Virgin Galactic, I mean, uh, Sierra Nevada's Dream Chaser uh, is built on, the, on the, the legacy of the X-15, a lifting body that had, had sort of wings and allowed us to come back and land somewhere instead of just plopping back in the ocean or something like that. Next slide. This is, uh, NASA, NASA always also does a lot of aeronautics, uh, works with airplane companies, works with moving people through, uh, through the air transportation system, and this is just one of the things that our aeronautics mission directorate does in, in terms of new technology development, uh, working in hypersonics, test flight. This was uh, X-51, uh, a rocket that actually flew in in the atmosphere up to, um, oh, Mach 6 point some odd. So hypersonic flight uh, in the atmosphere. That's pretty tough to do and survive, and we do that. Next slide. Um, science, I mentioned science is our, probably our second largest directorate next to human exploration. Uh, science is divided again into four different major organizations, Earth science that studies our own planet, uh, planetary science that studies all the planets used to be, all the planets of the solar system. Today it studies billions of planets throughout, our, throughout the universe um, with experiments like Kepler, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and others, we now have discovered that there are not only planets in the, 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 the eight, nine, if you're like me, planets in our solar system, but there are literally millions and millions of other planets orbiting other suns. And what we're looking at now, the thing that's intrigued people is planets that we call exoplanets. They're Earth-like planets orbiting other suns. And we, the, the, the two big questions that NASA is always asking ourselves, uh, how did we get here? And are we alone? So those are the two questions. I think, I think it was said that I dealt with aliens, uh, <laughs> maybe some of the people with whom I work. <laughs> but uh, but I, I have looked for them, but on my four space shuttle missions, I never saw any evidence that there are actually extraterrestrials or other forms of life 
outside of Earth and its atmosphere, but that is not to say there aren't. I, I happen to be one who believes that there is a pretty good possibility we will find some form of life somewhere else. Right now, we hope that we'll find it on Mars. Uh, that's one of the primary objectives of Curiosity as is it, is it gets ready to climb Mount Sharp, coming up out of the big crater that it's in right now, is to look at the various layers of of uh, geologic development of the Martian planet and see if maybe in one of those layers there is some form of life or some, 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 uh, some sign that there was life at one time. But we do uh, uh, astrophysics, which is the study of the universe, energy, everything. That, it's astrophysics that asks the big question about how did we get here? What, how was the universe formed? Um, and then finally, um, let me see, I covered astrophysics, oh, heliophysics, the study of the sun. Heliophysics has become incredibly interesting of late because we now have this phenomenon we call space weather. Uh, it's what messes with your radio, messes with your cell phone, messes with your internet and everything on a day that the sun burps and burps really big, then you get these big bursts of energy and if they go all over the place and if they happen to come in the direction of Earth, uh, we, sh you know, we shelter astronauts on the International Space Station. Uh, we do a lot of different things to satellites that are on orbit, trying to make sure that they're not damaged by the, the incredible burst of energy that come from our sun. So, so that's our science uh, directorate. Uh, these are just, go ahead, that's, that's good. This is just an example of the, uh, just the, the plethora, if you want to put it that way, of satellites that are orbiting our planet and other planets today in the four different areas where NASA does studies. The, the important part about most of these is that they're international efforts. So uh, for, geez, 50 years now, we've been cooperating with the European Space Agency and CNES. Um, CNES has been with us, the, the French Space Agency, has been engaged with us on, on, uh, for 15 years on going to Mars. So uh, it, it, all of our exploration is, is an international effort, and we, in, we involve more and more international partners as we go along. Next slide. This is just an artist concept of Curiosity. We landed Curiosity on Mars August of 2012. Uh, Curiosity is the size of a car. So if we were to land it in here, if we were to bring it in here, Curiosity is about as big as this thing over your head. It weighs uh, a ton, uh, metric ton, so um, it's big. And it's, it's crawling around the Martian surface now. Uh, has cameras all over it. This is a weather station built by the Spanish uh, in the Astrobiology Center outside of Madrid, Spain. It measures wind direction and speed, temperatures, uh, all kinds of stuff on Mars. The camera system was done by um, uh, James Cameron of Avatar fame. Uh, it, he actually has a, comp a tech company that, that develops cameras. He has a technique where he takes two monocular cameras and creates 3D images of, of the Martian surface. Uh, he has a 3D camera that's in development and hopefully we'll get an opportunity to fly it on a future Mars mission. And then Mars has its own robotic uh, uh, probe this can drill, it can scoop, it can do all kinds of things. And Curiosity itself is like a, a big chemistry lab, a set of chemistry labs. So it has a number of different analyzers. They take samples, put it into the different chemistry labs on the, on the, sh on the rover, and measures the, the makeup of the Martian surface as well as the Martian atmosphere. Next slide. Um, this is an example of a project that we work around the world. We cooperate with the... Uh, um, in America, it, it's called the U.S. Agency for International Development, but we work in three different places around the world, Panama for Central and South America, Nairobi, Kenya for East Africa, and Kathmandu, Nepal uh, for the Himalayan region, where we provide 30 years' worth of archived earth science data and real-time data from a series of about 16 satellites that are constantly orbiting Earth called the A-Train. Uh, where we measure everything from soil moisture, hum uh, the makeup of the atmosphere, uh, rainfall, you name it, to try to help other countries do things that have societal value, so fulfill societal needs, helping them to build drought and flood models, helping with disaster relief and, and disaster management. Next slide. Uh, I just throw this in because it's a beautiful image. Anybody know where that is? Out of curiosity? Some of you who have been in space? Yes. That's the Nile. That's absolutely right. The Nile River winding north. 
uh, on its way up to the Nile River Delta, this, the Mediterranean right up here that you can kind of see under the clouds, the Sinai Peninsula, the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aqaba, Western Saudi Arabia, if I had taken this, and we took this uh, when we, on my mission when we deployed the Hubble Space Telescope in 1990, if we had taken this image a few seconds later, you would have been seeing uh, Eastern Saudi Arabia, maybe Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, all that. So you travel around the world, around Earth, once every 90 minutes. Uh, so it's pretty quick. So every hour and a half, you get another glimpse at Earth. 45 minutes of daylight, 45 minutes of darkness, 45 minutes of day night, 45 minutes of darkness. 16 times every normal Earth day, you see the sunrise and the sunset, and you just kind of get used to it. But if you notice that, um, this is daytime, so the sky uh, or, or space is black. Uh, our sun is so bright that it just completely overwhelms the ability of the human eye to discern stars in the daylight. And so although you're looking at a black sky or black space, you just don't see any stars. When you get around Earth on the dark side, all of a sudden there's zillions of them. And, uh, and they're absolutely breathtaking. And you say, well, but there's so many, you probably can't tell anything. You can't see constellations and the like. Quite the contrary, because they are so brilliant and there's no, no scintillation, no, nothing to disturb your, your ability to see them, the constellations stand out even more. Uh, you can see, you know, planets, stars, all kinds of stuff. So it's, it's pretty spectacular. Earth, as I said before, is absolutely breathtaking. Uh, I picked this image because it's, uh, I think most people know what goes on in this part of the world. Uh, it looks so peaceful when you look from the vantage point of space. And so you, when I talk about changing your perspective, uh, you know, you're floating in space and you look down on this part of the world and you say, hmm, that doesn't look at all like I know it really is. Why is that? And you realize that that's the way it's intended to be. And we mess it up. So you kind of ask yourself, what can I do to make it different? What can I do to make this part of the world really be the way that it, that it appears to be from space? And so when I talk about changing your perspective, that's kind of what it does. Next slide. Um, just, we do a lot of technology development. When we look at, when you talk about going to an asteroid or going to Mars, we're going to need uh, new types of propulsion. Solar electric propulsion, while not new, we're trying to develop larger power systems that will enable us to get larger, more powerful engines that can, can drive things like an asteroid. And kind of very gradually, over about a year, year and a half, uh, divert it from, from the path that it's on, say if it's en route to Earth. Uh, you don't need to deflect it very much. If you can ch cause it to change its course ever so slightly, then you, you cause it to miss Earth. And, and we've got an asteroid initiative that we really want to take an asteroid, either capture it or get, a, get on it somehow, and over about a year to a year and a half, cause it to very, veer its course off just a little bit and get it toward the moon where it'll get captured into lunar orbit. We'll put it in a stable orbit around the moon where astronauts can then go fly to it and do different kinds of operations with it, learn how to mine, get samples, and bring them back to Earth for study. Uh, expandable habitats. We're looking at other ways. The International Space Station has been absolutely incredible for 15 years. It's been continually inhabited now for more than 13 years. But we need other places other than the International Space Station. Uh, so we have one company in America that, that looks at the con concept of an expandable habitat. Uh, it goes into space uh, fabric that's kind of folded up on a, on a metal tube. When it gets into space, the, the inside of the tube expands, uh, and you've got a habitat in which people can live, or you can do experimentation, you can do pharmaceutical work, all kinds of stuff. Thermal protection system is what keeps a vehicle safe when it comes back, whether, it la whether it's landing on Mars or landing uh, back here on Earth. It gets really hot coming back through the atmosphere, and so we need something to protect the vehicle. Uh, fuel depots, is a, that's something that we really would like to have for the future. When you talk about long-duration space flight, you talk about going to other places outside of our solar system, we'll need ways that we can put fuel, store it on orbit, where a spacecraft doesn't have to leave Earth weighing just 
tons and tons and tons, but you can get a much lighter spacecraft. It goes to a fuel depot, refuels on orbit, and then goes to its ultimate destination. Next slide. Um, we do lots of partnerships, lots of technology development. That's just an example. I mentioned the U.S. Agency for International Development. That's the administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development and me shaking hands over a memorandum of agreement we did. Some of the work we did in East Africa with Severe. That's our robot that's on the International Space Station now called Robonaut 2. Uh, Robonaut 2 is a humanoid robot that uh, is now learning how to work with astronauts. Astronauts are learning how to work with Robonaut 2. Uh, what do you want to, you know, what does it want to do? We want to make sure that Robonaut knows how to move its, its arms and, and not <laughs> bang an astronaut. And astronauts know how to recognize that Robonaut is doing stuff and stay out of the way of it. Uh, it has five fingers, just like we do. Uh, it can reach out and shake your hand. It uh, doesn't talk, uh, any of that stuff. It's not one of those thinking robots. But it can be programmed to do mundane tasks like vacuuming, uh, it, can, it can use a drill, it can use a wrench, it can do all kinds of stuff. And so we're trying to perfect that. Next slide. And I'll let you look at that for a while. You all didn't have any questions. Questions. I need questions. Questions. We have time. Yes. Yes. Why only five fingers? Why only five fingers? Because we were trying to make it like a human. It's a humanoid. Uh, if you look, the, the head, go back, go, where are you? Go back one time. <laughs> You've disappeared. If you look, you can't, you probably can't see it over there. Uh, this is R2 looking down at its hands. Uh, R2 has eyes like a human. The eyes are two cameras, so, so Robonaut can look around and it can recognize patterns and things. We can train it. Uh, for example, it was developed in cooperation with General Motors, with the automobile manufacturer. They were to put splash curtains, the, the curtains that go in your car or truck on the door to keep the water from coming into the vehicle compartment, into where the people are. Uh, to put it in, it requires a lot of pressure because there's an adhesive strip that goes around that seals it into the door. And General Motors was finding that they were actually getting wrist damage to the workers on the production line who were doing it. And they were looking for some, some way to solve that problem. And we came up, we were looking for some way for uh, a robot to offload astronauts from doing mundane tasks outside in space. Unless you really have to, you don't want to send astronauts out to do spacewalks. I know they look like a lot of fun, but spacewalks are incredibly risky. So if there are, if there are normal, normal things that we can do, like uh, changing out an electrical fitting or hooking up a refueling line or something like that, a robot can be trained to do that. And so we designed Robonaut 2 to be able to do the things that the astronauts did, and we just settled on, okay, if it can have five fingers like an astronaut, and it can use those, hand, those hands and fingers like an astronaut, we like that. R Robonaut 2 does not have a lower torso. It's just an upper torso. Uh, its successors, Robonaut 3, 4, 5, um, now have, we're developing a lower torso so that it can move around on, on, the, on the truss, on the outside of the space station, much like an, astro an, an, an astronaut can. With no gravity, you don't need to walk around, but it still m may need to, to use its legs to hold on to things. And other. What we learned from that was we developed something called the exoskeleton. When you talk about offshoots or, or things you never dreamed of, uh, by working on the lower torso for exoskeleton, we developed something called the exoskeleton, and it's just the exterior of the legs. Uh, a wounded veteran can put an exoskeleton on. It has a computer device that goes around the waist, and a veteran who could not walk, a paraplegic who could not walk, can now don the exoskeleton and can walk around. When they first started it, they had to use canes to keep them upright, and the veterans complained, you know, this is great that I can walk but I can't work because I, I, don't, I don't have use of my hands. You know, I need to use my hands just to stay upright. So we went further and we developed some sensor pads for Robonaut's feet. So there are pads that now go on the feet of Robonaut and now on the feet of the exoskeleton and they can actually sense when the body is upright and now a veteran can walk. Uh, one that formerly could not walk at all and they can walk around much the way that they used to be able to do. Uh, the glove is like Robonaut's hand, a uh, veteran who, if they have any part of their hand left, they can put it in the what we call the robo-glove. Uh, the robo-glove can be programmed uh, to do what they say do, what they think about it doing. 
It can grasp a, a jar, it can grasp a glass, it can grasp a wrench, and it can allow them to do work that they couldn't do before because they just didn't have the, the strength in the hand or didn't have the mobility in the hand uh, to do anything. So, so that's kind of why it, it's like a human right now. There's nothing to say it couldn't be 10 fingers. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Is, uh, is ESA planning? Yeah, no, yes, planning as a matter of fact, um, the, the, big, the big objectives that NASA's prime goal in human space flight right now, if you would ask us, what's, what's our goal in life? Uh, it's with our international partners to put humans on Mars in the 2030s. President uh, Obama went to the Kennedy Space Center in 2010, and, uh, and he challenged NASA to do two things. Uh, put humans on an asteroid at, by 2025 and humans on Mars in the 2030s. And so we are now doing everything that we can in human space flight to get there. The reason we're building the heavy lift launch vehicle, the Orion multipurpose crew vehicle, is to give us the, the means to get there. Uh, just last year, we signed a, an agreement. It's something that's called the, the um, uh, Global Exploration Roadmap. We signed it with 11 other nations, so there are now 12 nations of the world that more that worked on it, but 12 signatories to the Global Exploration Roadmap that says the ultimate destination for humanity in, in this century is Mars. Uh, and on the way, we will go to, to the, back to the moon, we will go to asteroids and other places in the solar system. Uh, we'll do all kinds of exploration. So that's uh, ESA, Japan, uh, Russia, any number of different nations that have taken that on as a, an objective. So everything that you hear NASA do right now in terms of human spaceflight, the real reason that we stay on the International Space Station, and President Obama uh, recently uh, made the determination that we should, we should work to lead other, other partner nations to extend the life of the International Space Station from 2020 all the way out to 2024 at least, because that'll give us an opportunity to do a number of things. One, to develop the technologies that we need to go on to Mars, to buy down the risk. There are a lot of human risk, uh, risk to the human body that we've got to solve. The International Space Station represents the single platform uh, that's in space that allows us to, to, to solve those problems. Things like uh, muscle uh, atrophy, bone loss, uh, degradation of vision because of something we call increased intracranial pressure where the optic nerve gets squeezed. We don't know why. So there are a lot of things we don't understand. The International Space Station will give us an opportunity to work on that and solve those problems. And we'll buy down the risk one by one until we're ready to go. Okay. Yes? Never in my life as a kid did I ever dream of being an astronaut. I grew up in Columbia, South, South Carolina. Uh, and when I grew up in South Carolina, I grew up in the segregated South, which meant black kids went to school here, white kids went to school there. Uh, everything came in twos. You didn't mix, you didn't do anything. Uh, much like apartheid South Africa when, when South Africa had apartheid. Much like many areas of Europe today. Uh, where we just made the determination that the races would not be together. So that was the way I grew up. I knew who astronauts were, I knew what they were, but as I mentioned before, there was no hope in my mind, no hope for me ever becoming an astronaut because astronauts didn't look like me. You know, there were none. So I, I never entertained the idea of becoming an astronaut. Um, it, when I graduated from, the naval, from, from my high school in Columbia, South Carolina, I did something that I had wanted to do since I was in seventh grade. I went to the United States Naval Academy. I, I saw a program on television called Men of Annapolis that talked about life at the Naval Academy. And seeing that program, I decided that's where I want to go to school. I want to wear that uniform. I didn't have a clue, not a single clue, what a midshipman did other than what I saw on television. And I really didn't know what you did in the Navy. You know, my dad had served in the Army in World War II. Uh, and back then, you went in when you were drafted, and you came out at the end of the war. So my father spent World War II in the Army, and he didn't talk about it. And I didn't know a lot about what it was to be in the Army, but I knew I wanted to be a midshipman at the Naval Academy. Uh, I knew two things. When I, when I left Columbia, South Carolina, on the way to the Naval Academy, I was not going to be a Marine, without a doubt, because they were crazy. And I was not going to fly airplanes, because that was inherently dangerous. 
So those were the those were the two things that I knew for a fact. How many of you have done this already in your life? I am never going to do that. And what are you doing today? Messing with computers. Yeah. What? Would never come back to Paris. You would never come back to Paris. Is that right? <laughs> I mean, we, we seriously, though, we all say something when you stop and think about it. You know, it's 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 not stupid, but it's 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 immature to say I am never going to do something. We just don't know. And I, it, it was the it was the actions of a kid. I am never going to be a Marine. I am never going to fly an airplane. I, I cannot do this. That's why I told you in the beginning, don't be afraid of failure. One, uh, you know, when, when asked if I was going to fly an airplane, I knew it was dangerous and I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to die. I didn't want to fail. I was afraid of that. Uh, I wanted to play football when I was a kid. My father was my high school football coach. But I was small. I was undersized. And so my mother didn't want me to play. My father didn't want me to play. Football, American football, okay? Um, that was something I said, okay, I don't care what they say. I'm going to play football. But we, ha we have to get ourselves to rise above the fears uh, that we have. So I never dreamed of being an astronaut. How did I become one? Uh, went to the Naval Academy, graduated, decided I wanted to be a Marine because I wanted to be like a person who had been my sort of my mentor my very first year at the Naval Academy as a plebe. A uh, young man by the name of Major John Riley Love, who was an infantry officer in the Marine Corps, tough like my dad, uh, but unbelievably fair. And when I got ready to graduate, I said, I want to be like him. I want to be just like him. I left to become an infantry officer. Found out I did not like crawling around in the mud. <laughs> so that took away the infantry officer thing. And my, I was married by then. My wife said, why don't we go to Pensacola, Florida? And I said, I don't want to go to Pensacola because you got to go fly, and I don't want to fly. And as usual, my wife was right. <laughs> and in time, I decided, OK, if I don't want to crawl around in the mud and I'm already a Marine, what can I do? I had an option to go to flight school, so I went to flight school. And the first time I took off in an airplane, I went, wow, I cannot believe this. I, re I really can't believe this is this cool. And so uh, as time went by in flight school, one of my instructors was a test pilot. He talked about how demanding it was to be a test pilot. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't fancy and, and glamorous the way people made it out to be. It was hard work, and I decided that's what I want to do. So my next goal became becoming a test pilot, and I applied for test pilot school for my first six or seven years flying airplanes, and I got turned down every time. And then uh, finally went back to school, got a master's degree, and I said, okay, I'll apply one more time, and if I don't get in this time, I'll find something else. I'll, I'll take it as God telling me, forget it. And I got selected to go to test pilot school. And while I was there, um, I had an opportunity to meet a young man by the name of Dr. Ron McNair. I, call, I refer to him as the late, great Dr. McNair. Uh, Ron was in the very first group of shuttle astronauts, uh, just like me, had grown up in South Carolina, a place called Lake City, South Carolina, about 42 miles from my home. We didn't know each other. He was an African-American, but unlike me, Ron's dream was to be an astronaut, just like Franklin, you know. Ron was going to be an astronaut. His school did not teach chemistry and physics, did not teach calculus. He knew that if he wanted to be an astronaut, he had to learn chemistry and physics and calculus. He went to the public library where he could not go, and he walked in and he told the librarian, I want a book on physics and I want a book on calculus because I'm going to teach myself those two subjects. The librarian said, I'm sorry, can't let you have it. You don't belong here. He said, I'm not leaving. And she called the policeman, policeman came, Policeman knew his mother, who was a teacher, you know, got on the phone, said, Ms. McNair, you need to come get your son. She came down. She pleaded with Ron to leave. He said, I'm not leaving. I'm going to teach myself calculus and physics, and I'm not leaving until I get the books. The policeman said <laughs> to the librarian, just give the boy the books. I'll get them back to you. Ron taught himself calculus and physics. Went to North Carolina A&T, graduated with honors, went to MIT, and Ron doubted himself. Ron told me, he said, you know, I got an offer to go to MIT, full scholarship. I said, I can't do that. I, I just, he, he told himself, I can't make it through MIT. MIT is this incredibly prestigious place. And he had a, a professor of his later who talked to him. And he said, Ron, you know, if you're an honor student at, at, at A&T, you can be an honor student at MIT. Just apply yourself and study. And so Ron said, OK, I'll try it. Went on, and just like Franklin, who became one of the world's foremost plasma physicists, 
Ron became one of the world's foremost laser physicists. But Ron also learned karate and, and martial arts. He was a fifth degree black belt. He was a, an accomplished jazz musician, played saxophone and almost any reed instrument. And Ron came to the, to the test pilot, uh, came to Pax River where I was a test pilot and we talked for a weekend. And uh, at the end of the weekend, I, I, I just kind of fell in love with what he was talking about. He said, are you gonna apply for the space program? I said, not on your life. And he looked at me and he said, why not? I said, they never picked me. I mean, I, I shrank back into this, you know, being afraid again that I wouldn't get selected. I said, they'll never pick me. And Ron looked at me. He said, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. He said, how do you know? How do you know they won't pick you if you don't ask? And I got embarrassed, to be quite honest, because that was what my mom and dad had taught me all my life, that you can do anything you want to do as long as you're willing to work and study and just go for it. And so Ron went back to Houston, and I went home and talked to my wife, and I said, you know what, I think I'm going to apply for the space program. I was 34 years old, and uh, filled out my application, sent it to NASA, got an opportunity to go to Houston and interview, and got selected in the second group of space shuttle astronauts. Uh, I would have never done that had I not met Ron McNair. So, you know, every single one of you meets someone or sees someone who touches you in some way, and you say, I want to be like her or I want to be like him, and then you go for it. And you never dreamed you could do that. So you really have to apply yourselves. I hope the reason that every single one of you came to this school, this particular environment, is because it, the other schools just weren't doing it for you. You know, you, you wanted to learn, but you just, teachers couldn't reach you, all kinds of reasons. And so you heard about this place and you came here. And hopefully you're getting what you came for. You're finding that you've got to work really hard, and you've got to study in order to get through, uh, but you can do it if you apply yourself, because that's what will get you there. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, what was the sense I like most? Oh, the thing I like most in my time in, in the space program or in space? Oh, good, because people ask me all the time, what was the best thing that happened to you in, when you were in the space program? And it wasn't flying in space, by the way. It was getting ready for my last flight when we brought Sergei Krikalov and Vladimir Titov, two Russians and their families, from Moscow to the United States. And they lived in Houston, Texas for two years, you know, around us and with us, learned our culture. We learned about them. Uh, it changed my life forever. And it also impacted my kids. My kids were in, in school. Sergei's son, uh, daughter was Olga, who was four when she came. Uh, Vladimir had a son and daughter. She was 18. The, do the son was eight. Um, and they became American in every sense in the two years that they lived there. So that was the, the thing that I, that I value the most for my whole time in the space program. But in space, I think other than the sensation of being weightless, which is just fun, uh, the sensation of viewing Earth from, from that vantage point and seeing it the way that I showed you on that image, and that's not even close. To be quite, as good as that is, if, if you've ever seen an IMAX movie that's been filmed on the International Space Station or from the space shuttle, that's pretty close, but that's not close. The human eyes, these cameras are absolutely magnificent in how they view and interpret this planet on which we live. And you look at it in all of its beauty and grandeur. And again, you go back, it, it, it just, you say, okay, I got it. That is one incredibly beautiful, rich place. But we are going to destroy it if we're not really careful. When I showed you this, look at this. That thin blue line, that's our atmosphere. That's it. And for all intents and purposes, it's about 10,000 feet. Eh, okay, Obi. Meters, meters, meters. Anyway, yeah, what's that? 30 meters? 30 kilometers? Something? Just say it is, okay? <laughs> just, it may not be. Yeah, it's not very much. Yeah, it's just like that. Yeah, it's just like that. It may not be. But anyway, it's not very much. And, and when, you get, when you get outside that first 30 kilometers, there's not enough oxygen to breathe. So humans can't live above that without an oxygen mask or something else. You get out here, and you cannot survive. It's vacuum. So... That's all that keeps us alive, is that. And you can go around Earth sometimes, and you look, and it's just brown and cruddy. 
and you look down on some parts of Earth, and it's not as beautiful as the section of the Middle East I showed you. Uh, when I was flying back in the 90s, there were parts of the Soviet Union, or Russia, it had become Russia, uh, where in the wintertime with snow on the ground, it was just black with soot, you know, from coal-fired plants and all that kind of stuff. And it, there are things we have to do uh, to guard the planet. And, and you learn, that was what I learned from the perspective of space. So the, the opportunity to view this planet from that perspective was the, just the thing that I enjoyed the most and I cherished the most. Other, yes? <laughs> Not yet, but we're working on it. His question was, he heard that NASA made a, used a 3D printer to make pizza. What we are doing, in, in, we have an astrobiology center at the Ames Research Center out in Mountain View, California. They are looking at uh, synthetic food, uh, synthetic beef, uh, you know, where you take microbes and you use the mic. You got to have some form of life. You can't make it from nothing but you take microbes and you create something that tastes very much like beef. Uh, why is that important? Because if we could take a spaceship that we're gonna send to Mars or somewhere else, give the crew several containers of microbes, you know, and, and train them and how you use those microbes and develop them and you let them mature into pieces of meat or vegetables, that's great. That cuts down a lot of room. But we're using, we are using 3D printers. We're getting ready to send one to the International Space Station this year, I think. And we're going to make small components. Uh, there'll be things like, um, uh, oh, um, wheels, you know, turbine wheels and the like. We've already built, using 3D printers, uh, components of a turbo machinery for a rocket engine. And then we've put it into the rocket engine, put it on a test stand at the Stennis Space Flight Center and, and actually fired up the rocket, and they work. So we've demonstrated the fact that we can do it. The advantage of 3D printing, if, if, if there are any of you who don't know, and I doubt that there's anybody in here who doesn't know, is we can make incredibly complex pieces uh, without having to cut a lot of different pieces. We can make machinery, we can make pieces that, you know, that turn on each other, and it all comes from just powder or a or a thin thread that's sent into the 3D printer. Uh, lasers melt it uh, and then take the powder or the strand and turn it into a structure and it, and it builds it from the ground up and the next thing you know, you've got this turbine wheel or whatever it is. And we've, we've, uh, we've made some pretty big things with 3D printers. A uh, big duct for a, for a hypersonic jet engine. Uh, so it's pretty impressive. Uh, one of the things we've got to do is figure out how do you make it smooth because it's kind of rough when it comes out, and, and the inside of a turbo pump, you want to be really smooth. Otherwise, you get you know oxygen molecules going through there, big fire. That's not good. Yes. Any program related to terraforming? Again, we have people who who are really, uh, I guess the right word is disciples. People who really believe in terraforming. Terraforming is injecting some small quantity of heat into uh, a frozen area. Uh, people think about, talk about terraforming a lot in terms of Mars. Since Mars is essentially a frozen planet now, there are those who believe if we could inject a certain amount of heat into the surface of Mars, over time that heat would spread, we would terraform, and, the, and you, Mars would return to the fertile surface that, it, that we believe it once was. We believe that Mars at one time was not very much unlike Earth that it had plants and all kinds of stuff, and it was very fertile and not cold, uh, but, but a temperate climate. Uh, we've tested terraforming down in Antarctica and places, and so my understanding is that they, they met with some, some degrees of success. People do it a lot in areas like Alaska, uh, the Antarctic, where they have permafrost, where the ground freezes and it just stays frozen forever. Uh, they'll go in and inject a certain amount of heat and just watch it as it spreads out over time. But, there's one thing, you know, to, to heat up a particular area and have a, uh, I don't know, a, a square kilometer melt or whatever you do. That's different trying to do that to a planet. But I'm not saying it can't be done. Yeah, we're looking at it. Yes? Yes. 
Is there a plan for a permanent station on the moon? Everybody wants to go to the, everybody. Most of our, everybody, everybody, yeah, everybody. I think I can say that. Uh, most, most countries want to go to the moon. And remember when I started out, what did I say about nobody in this room except four of us? Was that the count finally? Five of us who, uh, who know what it was like to watch humans walk on another surface in the solar system other than Earth. Um, everybody wants to go back to the surface of the moon because everybody wants to have that experience. And we find it in our international partners and everybody. Everybody wants to go to Mars uh, because the moon is so much closer and because everybody believes, and, and it's true, the moon is accessible because we know how to go there. We've been there. So the technology to get to the moon is already in our grasp. We already have that. We, we've got a lot of work to get to Mars because of the radiation we've got to overcome, the technology to speed up our transit there and everything. So a lot of our partners would like to go back to the surface of the moon. We would like to go back to the surface of the moon at the right time. And the next time you go, it will be to colonize. It will be to establish permanent uh, habitations there so that people can do things. Same thing with Mars. I think when you go to Mars, uh, it's not going to be like the first time humans went to the moon. People will go to Mars to stay there and to do things. Uh, and one of the reasons it's so important to determine whether or not Mars can sustain life is because if we find that it did one time or it can now, then that makes the opportunities to make it a habitable environment even more promising. And so you could, you could easily say, okay, we can go there. Uh, is it going to be cold? Yeah. But we live in cold, humans live in cold places right now. Some places that are warmer than Mars, as a matter of fact, the last few weeks. So yes, I think so. Was there another question up there? Okay, y yes. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, my goals now, though, um, I am becoming a, a, a non-Westerner in my goals in life and my philosophy. And I, I use that term loosely. Westerners, mainly Americans, and maybe Westerners, but we, I think Americans perhaps are the only civilization that has to have everything right now. Uh, you know, we don't think about doing something taking part in something that we will never get to see. That's just, that's just unimaginable in an American mind, in most American minds. It's just not in our DNA. Almost every other culture in the world, uh, they think hundreds of years out, and they think generations out, and they want to make things better for their granddaughters. So I'm transitioning to another world you know, culture, and my goals in life now are to make it possible for my granddaughters to walk on Mars, uh, a lot of the stuff I'm doing now in NASA, uh, I won't see. You know, I'm not going to go to Mars, probably. <laughs> because I, I actually came to NASA, believe it or not. When I came to NASA in 1980, we were so close, we thought. You know, we had started flying. We hadn't flown the space shuttle yet when I came to NASA in 1980. The shuttle was supposed to have flown the first time in 1978. We got behind. I mean, we struggled to get it flown. And then we finally flew in April of 1981. And shuttle was going really, really well. Uh, we began to think that, okay, we're going to fly shuttle a little while longer. We're going to build a, an orbiting sta space station. We're going to use that to put together rockets that will then take us to the moon and on to Mars and other places. So when I became an astronaut, I thought I was going to fly on the shuttle a few times become a moon, a lunar astronaut, for a few times, and then go on to Mars. And I honestly believe that. So my goal in coming to NASA back then was to go to Mars. Um, I would like to now make that dream possible for my granddaughters. And they're 13, 11, and 7, so I think we can do that. Um, my goal is to find a way to help people understand the value of taking care of the planet. Uh, will that happen in my lifetime? I would hope so, but I'm not sure. But, but, I'll, but I'm going down fighting, so I, I keep trying to do that. So I, I, I have lots of aspirations to do things, but most of them now are not for me. They're for my, my grandkids and my great-grandkids and all that kind of stuff. So talk about, you know, having the view of Earth from, from a different perspective changes your, your way of thinking, I think. Okay, yes? Uh, actually, I guess that universe is, um, if you think about universe, it's about 12% of gravity. And which means that it's 86% of dark things, dark right. matter, right. and dark energy, which means dark. So you don't, 
don't know. <laughs> we don't know exactly what it is. Yeah. Um, do you think that if we find in that there are things, a way maybe to go faster, uh, quicker, shorter, a way to go from Earth to Mars or to another part on the I think so, but I'm not. I'm not a you know. I'm not a physicist or a really smart person like that. But we have a we have a, an experiment on the International Space Station right now called the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, and it is a conglomeration of oh geez, I want to say scientists from about 30 or 40 different nations. Uh, we one team is is a Taiwan a Taiwanese scientist and a and a, and a uh, PRC scientists working together. It is a basic physics experiment. And what it's trying to, it's just collecting uh, atoms and molecules that are coming in from space. And what they're hoping is that one of those, one, will be an antimatter particle. Uh, they want to be able to prove the existence of antimatter, which is sort of like what you're talking about. Demonstrate that, that yeah, we can show what dark energy is. We, we can show what dark matter is. There really are antimatter particles. That will change, uh, that will change everything as we know it. That, um, and, and so there is a, the alpha magnetic spectrometer is trying to find that right now. All they need is one. And they've got billions of particles that have come in, but you know, the, just going through all of them and determining, okay, what is that? That's a proton. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, qu a quark or whatever. I don't know, but they're looking for it. Yeah, we're hoping. I mean, we're constantly looking for. It's going to be something we don't know, and it's going to be something that will probably just startle us. That it was right here. We've been looking at it. You know, we've been looking at it for decades. And we just didn't know. And that's the, that's, the, that's the magic of discovery. That's the magic of what we call exploration. You know, To explore means to go out and search. I don't have a clue what's out there. And that, the hard part about doing what we do in NASA is everybody is in this value proposition. So we are constantly being asked to demonstrate what, the re what is the return on investment of sending humans to the International Space Station. What's the return on investment of sending humans to Mars? You know, you ask me, what's the return on investment of building an airplane? That's easy, because I can tell you, I build an airplane, I can put 150 people in it, I can charge them X amount, uh, so for a $150 million airplane, I can, ca I can recap $300 million. So the return on investment is, you know, $150 million. That's easy. I can't put a value on something that I don't even know yet, what, what's going to be discovered. I, we just don't know. So that's what's fun about it. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Because I think I ran, oh, OK. Yes, back there and then here. Have you watched Credit Me? <laughs> <laughs> Great movie. Now, let me be specific. <laughs> some of it not very realistic, some of it probably not physically possible, you know, the, the, engine, the, the, the physics and all that other kind of stuff just doesn't compute, but it's a great movie. Who cares? <laughs> I mean, I was sitting there with my wife, and my wife was going, Does this, can this really happen? I said, Jackie, relax. It's a, <laughs> it's a movie. Just enjoy it. Sandra Bullock was awesome. I mean, just think about it. You know, it's, I mean, Gib, Gib Kirkham and I over here, we were talking about it. For people who went through Challenger and went through Columbia, there are parts of it that are just unsettling. Uh, you know, you see the, when the space station is just coming apart, debris going, that's a bad, bad feeling. That's a, that's a horrible set of scenes to be, I get emotional about stuff. That's a, that's a really hard set of scenes to watch because it is so reminiscent of watching Columbia come apart, you know, as it, as it came in over the west coast of the United States and just, then just literally disintegrates. And, and people on Earth saw it. I mean, they saw particles on fire going across the sky and stuff like that. And that, that's the bad part about gravity. But it doesn't ha we don't think it would happen like that in space. But the, a good part about it, we were talking about this, is there a good lesson to take from gravity? I think so. Because it's gravity, and there's another one called, what is it, Europa? Europa Report. Euro, Europa Report. Um, very unrealistic, but very exciting. You know, landing on Europa, an icy moon of Jupiter. Uh, people who went to do this thing and knew that they probably were not going to get back home. And unfortunately, nobody gets back home. 
<laughs> but that's, you know, that's what they went to do, to discover. And it takes, it takes people like that to do the kind. Just think about where I come from, the United States of America. None of us who are here visiting you today would be here had it not been some, for some crazy Europeans, you know, some Italians and Spaniards and others that decided, hey, there's a body of water there, and if I can get across that and get around another way to India, for example, man, we can make a lot of money. <laughs> you know, there are all kinds of spices there, and we don't want to go that way because it's dangerous. We want to go that way. A little bit longer, but that's okay. I know they say the world's flat, but we know that's not the case. We're just going to sail around, and we'll go around there. And they stumbled across the U.S. Now, there were already some people there who knew how good it was, and that, that's an ugly story, but, but still. Um, the, number, the percentage of people who survived the passage from Europe to the Western world is minuscule. Think about it. The people that left the East Coast, the original 13 colonies going west, just to get to the Mississippi River, just to get there, is minuscule. The number who decided, okay, we're going to cross the Mississippi. After Lewis and Clark went scooting up the Mississippi, went all the way out into places people didn't even know existed, they said, man, we're going out west. We're going out there because there's nobody. There's going to be great land out there. They died, many of them, most of them. But they were, they were in search of something they did not know, in search of a better life, in search of riches, in search of all kinds of stuff. That's who we are. That's who you are. You know, some of you are here for that very reason. You got some wow butt dream, you know, that you're going to get rich. <laughs> it'll happen. Trust me, it'll happen to some of you. You know, but you're going to do it with computers or you're going to do it with programming. That's, that's, that's what's in our DNA. We always, there's always some place better than where we are, and we want to go there. And so some of you are going to be like me. You know, you're going to say, man, I never dreamed of going to space. But... <laughs> That sounds like that's pretty cool. <laughs> and they say it can't be done, and I'm going to show them. It can be done. I'm not going to be afraid of failing. You know, maybe I won't make it. When we lost Challenger, I flew the last flight before Challenger. Uh, I had actually trained with the Challenger crew, so they were all very, very dear friends. We landed on, uh, you know, on January 18th, 1986. I was about as high as one could be, just in elated that I had done this thing I never dreamed of doing. I had been to space. And uh, I mean, I was as high as a kite. You could not believe it. And, and I was that way for 10 days. You know, we were going through our debrief and all this kind of stuff, and we, we took a break to watch, to watch our friends go launch. And we were sitting in the, in the conference room at the Johnson Space Center, and we watched Challenger lift off. And 73 seconds in the flight, we saw this, boom, this big thing, and we said, hmm, that's not right. Uh, I, I know nothing bad has happened, but that's not right. And sure enough, something really bad had happened. And so just like that, seven dear friends and a multi-billion dollar spacecraft was gone. And so I started thinking. I said, you know, do I really want to do this? And I, I, I think I thought for about a nanosecond. You know how short that is. I said, that's why I came here. Not to die, but I came here to make the world better. I came here to explore. I came here to to do things that people had never done before. And so I stayed and, and flew again and again and again. And um, that's why we do stuff. So hopefully some of you will be inspired to go do those same kinds of things. And you don't have to be an astronaut to make a difference. Uh, I put this up just to share it with you. I'll tell you this story and then I'll get out of here. Um, Nikosi Johnson, huh? anybody ever read about Nikosi Johnson? Anybody know the story? He's a, he was 12 years old at the time of his death in 2001. Uh, but Nikosi was born in a place called KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, born uh, to an African mother who had AIDS. She had been infected by her husband, uh, and she knew she was going to die. And so she found a, a young white woman who was a friend of hers, and she said, you know, I'm getting ready to have a child. Um, I'm going to name him Nikosi if it's a boy, and when he's born, uh, would you take him and raise him for me? Because I'm not, I know I'm not going to live. And Nikosi's mother died after he was born, and Gail Johnson took him on to be her son. And, and Gail and everybody who ever got to know Nikosi said he was different. Uh, from the moment he could speak, he was barking out orders. He was telling people, we've got to do this. We've got to do that for the village. We've got to make this better. He was always crusading to make things better for other people. Um, born with AIDS, he knew he was going to die. 
uh, rack with sores all his life and everything. They said never cried out in pain, never asked for anything, always wanting to help other people, looking for a cure for AIDS. He and Gail traveled all over South Africa and then eventually all over the African continent and then all over the world crusading for a cure for AIDS. And uh, an American writer by the name of Jim Wooten heard about him, met him, uh, he ended up talking to him, was so inspired because he asked Nikosi, why do you do what you do? And Nikosi said, you know, I may be black, I may have AIDS, I may be poor, but in this world, we're all the same. And so he wrote a very small biography of Nikosi Johnson called We're All the Same. And he went back to the United States and um, said a little bit later, he got a call, said, hey, if you want to see Nikosi again, you better hustle because he is, he is on his deathbed. He's not going to make it. And so he flew all the way back to South Africa, sat by Nikosi's side. He said Nikosi was laying there 12 years old, weighed less than 20 pounds, uh, nothing but skin and bone, sores and pus all over everywhere and this beautiful black face with a smile on it. Said Nikosi was, was laying there smiling, and he's telling people, do this, do that, do this, do that. And Jim Wooten said, he said, stop. Nikosi, stop. You're going to die. He said, Nikosi looked up at him, and he said, yep. <laughs> he said, you could die today. He said, yep. He said, OK. I, I, I don't get it, you know? You have never cried out in pain. You have never asked for anything. All you've ever done is try to help other people. What the heck makes you do that? And Nikosi looked up at him and he said, you do all you can with what you have at the time that you have in the place that you are. Hopefully you came here for some purpose, not just for you, but to make yourself better so that you can make your society better, so that you can make your community better, so that you can make your country better, so that you can make the world better. Every single one of us Nothing happens magically. Nothing. Everything starts with one person. Every great thing, every great thing that has ever happened starts with one person who inspires two, who in, that inspire three, that inspire a group, and things happen. That's the way things happen in this world, is some one person says, I'm going to do this, and inspires other people. So I hope all of you will take Nikosi's advice to heart and do what you can with what you have and the time that you have on this earth, because you can, in fact, make a difference. Thanks very much for, for your kindness. For allowing me to be here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I do have one thing I want to leave with you, just to sort of as a, as a memento of your kindness is uh, this montage, it's old. Uh, it's a new montage, but, but the thing, this is my, uh, it's my crew patch from STS-45, which was my third flight in space. This was uh, America's or NASA's first mission to planet Earth in which we were studying Earth's atmosphere and, and our sun, trying to understand some of the processes that go on. Uh, these are some images of uh, areas of France. Uh, the American flag and the French flag, I think, were all flown with me on STS-45. That's what it says, I hope. Uh, and then that's my crew from STS-45, the crew that was all upside down and everything, and plus, the, plus the three people that were missing. So if you'd accept that on behalf of, so of all of us. Thank you very much.